here we are. All right. Dude, this is our first, I think, in-person podcast since we did the Dilettantes podcast. Yeah. Which is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> and it wasn't even... We weren't even making an official podcast at the time. No, we weren't even fully together because uh, we were doing it with Jasper and uh, Simon from across uh, yep. across the country. This is definitely the way to do it. It's a lot more fun, a lot easier. Mm -hmm. I'm much more happy with this. Absolutely. Everybody and their moms is doing a <laughs> video podcast now. And uh, here we are. You know, first time we did in video, we had Josie in the background. Now we have my cat, Oliver, in the background. Yes, so he'll today... Be, he'll be we, hopping up and down this beautiful cat tree, if you can see it. Today we can just uh, have Oliver as our producer. We're definitely going to hear him yeah. during the entirety of the recording. He'll be taking calls. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if you only hear gibberish, that's because he's a cat. He can't talk. Um, so please be patient with him. He's learning. Yes. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about your pick to kick off this season. Yeah, Once man. upon a time in America. Yes, it was topical because I just moved to Brooklyn and they uh, start out as Brooklyn uh, little hoodlums, little gangsters running around. And I've always wanted to watch that movie, so I thought it was a good excuse to do so. Yeah, I agreed. I, uh, I first thought, I think the way you first pitched it to me was, or at least that's how I understood it, was that it was about uh, someone emigrating or immigrating to New York and making a life for themselves and that you were feeling that same way because you were technically doing that from Amsterdam to Brooklyn. And then as I watched it, I was like, that's not even close. Not to even close. What happens? It's just some street punks. Is that what I pitched it as? That's yeah. kind of crazy. You said that it reminded you of your situation. And I was like, not seeing that. Well, I'm very arrogant <laughs> then, aren't I? <laughs> um, no, but I really wanted to watch this for a long time. If we're just going to start with like the cast and crew it's because it's sergio leone and the older right. i get the more i think sergio leone is one of my all-time favorite directors i know it's not revolutionary to pick him as one <laughs> of your favorites but his style man like i really want to talk a lot today about how he stylizes his films how this movie is filled with a lot of good character actors like james woods and robert de niro and joe pesci but they're doing something I think so different than what they normally do. They normally are like very like dialogue heavy type of character actors. They go through the, their presence is really due to the fact on how they deliver their lines. Like think yeah. Pesci and Goodfellas. And well, also the directors they normally work with are dialogue heavy people like Scorsese. Exactly. And I think what's so unique about Sergio Leone is he comes from a background of spaghetti Westerns, which means you have a bunch of different languages on set. And therefore, the dialogue is always very minimal. They're, like The scenes with these guys are really more about their reactions to things. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, I feel like Pesci has like five lines in the whole thing. He, he does. But his presence <laughs> is so perfect. Yeah. Like, you don't forget he's in it. No, exactly. It's really, it's, it says so much with so little. Yeah. And Leone is such a master at showing rather than telling in so many instances. I mean, the first scene already is we don't know the what the thugs are doing when we first see them entering the opium mm -hmm. house but there's just shots of them pulling guys and lighting a like a lighter next to their face and like making you sit in that that tension that really gets across the point like these guys are searching for someone and it's going to be bad news bears when they find him yep oh my god it was i actually went back and i watched the opening scenes again after mm. I knew where the story was going, because it's so long that it's kind of hard to remember all the little things that you see in the beginning. I was actually going to say the opposite. I was going to say that normally a movie of that length or any movie just over like two and a half to three hours. Like this one's almost four hours. Um, when they cut back to that intro sequence of him at the opium house, I remember that vividly. Like everything that they and starting with God Bless America. Mm hmm playing that song they play that song at the end uh, as he's leaving the party and then they go back to the flashback of him at the opium house i remember both of those motifs like vividly how long did and it take you to finish the movie i watched it in three sittings three sittings so like an hour each time or something for the most part a little more on the first run and then like i think i watched like 45 minutes and then i had to do something and then i came back watched the last hour did you watch it in consecutive days or did you take day breaks 
uh, two days. Over two days. Yeah. So I, I was stupid and I watched it one day and then I just I think I took three days off and then watched the other part. Hmm. And I shouldn't have done that because that made me have to go back, you know, uh, to okay. those motifs. But even still, yeah, I could watch a movie, like I said, once, like two and a half or three hours, and it could be like good, mm-hmm. um, kind of boring or like slow or, you know, could be even be this, trying to be the same type of movie, but like not, just not done as impactfully and forget the tie-ins to the intro if they incorporated that. Yeah. There's a lot of movies where like I've watched them, I've wanted to watch them for a long time. Like one example is movie Sleepers. I don't know if you've seen that. Well, maybe. Who's in it? A lot of people. Um, I think I want to say Brad Pitt, and I know Kevin Bacon's in it. Uh, it it's a good cast. I have seen this movie. It's about the boys that get molested. At, um, yep. uh, yeah, I have seen this movie. And it's like very it's good a, movie. It's a good movie. But like after I watched it, for whatever reason, maybe it's just how I watched it, like the time of day I watched it or something, but it just didn't resonate with me that much as mm-hmm. much as like this movie did. Like upon yeah. the end, like. I remembered everything that happened for the most part. Any crucial moments, any crucial scenes, like character performances. That one, not as much. Yeah. There are movies like that. I actually recently just rewatched Seven and it did the same thing. You know, like Hmm. I like that movie a lot, but it's quite long and a slow burn and you forget things about it because it's so it's so long. Um, We. This movie, not so much. I agree with you. I, a lot of it stuck with me. The themes that kind of run through. I'm also, I know Leone's style. Um, you know that I'm a huge fan mm-hmm. of the Dollar Trilogy. And his style is so much about making you sit in a space. Yeah. And deal with just the sound of the space. And some key examples of that to me here are when they get Joe the diamonds. And like they cut to all of the reactions of every character while mm-hmm. Joe's counting the diamonds. You yep. know? And... They're long reactions. There's no words. You just hear the ruffling of the diamonds and you just see the shots of the different faces from James Wood's perspective to I think it's Patsy at the window's perspective to the driver's perspective. The same thing when Noodles is stirring the coffee. There's just that long scene of just that noise stirring the coffee Mm -hmm. and the ting, ting, ting. And like you can feel the unease like between the between the gang in that moment just by like sitting in that silence yeah he does he just does a great job at at just i guess i guess sound design in a way yeah because like something as simple as stirring coffee or counting diamonds like um i don't even i don't fully remember what proceeds the coffee stirring but i remember it leads to a very tense moment they, they find him in the the opiate opi- uh, opioid house after he rapes um oh uh, man what was her deborah, deborah and, and he's yeah. pretty like remorseful about his actions right that's what oh yeah because that's the intermission right yeah, that's the exactly. scene after the intermission and he's been like wasting away for weeks in the opi- opioid right. right house. yeah okay so. but yeah just they he makes actions even the simplest actions just add to the tension in the room like you know you don't know what's going to happen but you know some shit's about to go down there's there's two scenes in once upon a time in the west which by the way i I think i sent it to you in a text but i definitely want to watch this now it's called duck you sucker you're right and it's the movie he leone did before this and it's the second in the once upon a time trilogy so you have Mm -hmm. once upon a time in the west which is fantastic it's a little shorter for our viewers so that way you know you don't have to worry about another three hour four 50 film or something we got you but it's two scenes in once upon a time in the west that are just so memorable to me is the opening scene which takes like 10 to 15 minutes and there's not a single word spoken and it's just Hmm. uh outlaws waiting for a man coming off a train and like (laughs) all of what they're doing like there's water dripping from the ceiling there's one of them trying to fight a fly off (laughs) his face like i really want to read one of leone's scripts and i want to see oh yeah if his scenes are written so long or if it's really just a, a chunk of action that he decides to expand upon such a, in such a creative way. Yeah. I right. really, like how do you write that? How do you write that? I feel like there's no way the Once Upon a Time in America script is with the equivalent in, what is that, 60 times 3 is 180 and then another 45 minutes, so about like 230. There's no way it's 235 pages. Right. I feel like a lot of it is just him expanding on very simple things if it says noodles uh drinks his coffee then he decides i want him to stir that coffee 
methodically to almost make a rhythm cut to all of his companions facial expressions and really well thought out ones not just mm -hmm. like looking like you have um oh i forget the the ginger's name what was that mo 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 looks up and looks over at max and max looks back over at patsy and then like cockeye like just moves his eye a little <laughs> bit like just small yeah. things like that like it's it's in those moments that I really love Leone. Like, I don't know, this is only your second film from him, so I'm really curious yeah. to see if that kind of convinced you of his style. Like, Definitely, and the only one I've seen is uh, Fistful of Dollars. Yeah. And eventually, sometime after this podcast, I will watch the rest of that trilogy and more from him. Um, but, you know, that movie's like an hour 42, I think. Like, mm -hmm. super short, com comparatively speaking. Uh, but I still caught on those, like, traits the the slow action i i don't even know how long it takes for clint eastwood to actually say a full sentence and towards the beginning of that movie yeah but it's not like it's not within five minutes yeah. it's other people might be other people talking to him but our main character doesn't do or doesn't say much he just kind of has his actions you know he's quiet he's reserved but you know that he's capable of doing whatever it is that's going to happen in this film and that does happen with noodles too yeah. Like, you know, obviously we've seen him in the opioid house. Um, and then after that is him 30 years later. Um, but, you know, he still doesn't say and do much, but you get an idea of like his situation and like the mystery behind him. Absolutely. You want to learn more in these next like four hours. It separates out an actor, I think, that's good at delivering dialogue versus an actor who can embody a character. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys... I was really impressed with De Niro and James Woods and even Pesci, to be honest. I, I don't know the actors who played Cockeye and Patsy, but they... Yeah, one of, uh, Patsy looked like uh, Brandon Fraser. <laughs> he did look a little like <laughs> Brandon Fraser. I, this is a whole sub, separate uh, subject, so I'll bring it up after. But I was just really blown away at their ability to do so much with so little. And I really can see why people consider these to be some of the greatest actors ever, because mm -hmm. it, they embodied their character. Oh, yeah. the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, no pun intended, of their oh. characters. You know, they, yeah. they, and they showed you the emotional impact of everything that they did when they were doing it. You know, these mm -hmm. were not just one dimensional characters of Noodles, you know, decides to call the police on his friends. You see the emotional impact of doing something like this, you know? Ah, oh, man. I it's think so the, beautiful. The crazy thing just about Noodles' character development is like literally throughout the whole movie leading up to that intermission he's a bad man like yeah. he's there's nothing good about him even as a kid all he, he was the one who wanted to be bad he was the one who wanted profits to himself but he reluctantly like was like yes we'll, mm -hmm. we'll split it amongst the friend group um <clears throat> he was just so self-absorbed uh bugsy right exactly um so every all his actions were all about him and wanting to be um, just this badass street gangster in New York. And that carried over until he went in prison and he got out. He still kind of, he was a little reserved, but at the same time, like, he was ready to get back into it. And that all changes during that time where he tries to rat out Max and the rest mm -hmm. of the gang. And then after that, um, you know... He, it's more like Max took over as the bad guy, as like mm -hmm. the heartless dude and um, Noodles became more of the reserved. Well, yeah, I think that Max always had some form of bad, like I feel like Max was a bit of a bad influence after the after the jail scene. Yeah, for Because sure. Max, Max leads the gang in a, right. in a specific yeah. direction. Right, he carries them through the yeah. prohibition smuggling and opening exactly. their speakeasy and whatnot. But I would say something that I really agreed with, because Brian and I do our history on these films too. So I, I look up kind of interpretations of uh, other like film critics and I, I want to know, th these are not new conversations. Like where can we build upon what other critics have talked about in these movies? And one thing that I wanted to maybe talk about is the very simple one, um, Godfather versus Once Upon a Time in America. It's a very easy thing to kind of compare. A lot of people have compared it. Yep. And something I was reading about last night, I want to gauge your opinion on it is... I've read now that one thing that people agree that stands out about this movie that's better than The Godfather is that The Godfather kind of glamorizes the lifestyle of the mafia. Like, they're yeah, Vito, Cor sure. Vito Corleone, um, 
is kind of a redeemable protagonist and seen as an admirable father figure. And because of that, um, the other bad guys just seem like badder guys and it's, it's glamorizing, but there's not a lot to talk about how this lifestyle is damning. Like if you follow this lifestyle, mm -hmm. it's not something to be applauded. You will end up miserable and alone. Something that I think the Irishman, despite its length, did really well from Scorsese was that De Niro ends up alone in a retirement home by yep. himself, ironically the only one who didn't die mm -hmm. and no one ever to visit him. And it just shows you like this lifestyle will leave you sad oh. and miserable and by yourself. Yeah. And I mean, technically that same exact thing happens to Noodles. Exactly. So what I think I agree with, and I'll gauge your opinion on it, is this movie doesn't glamorize these guys like these guys mm -hmm. are bad guys the fr they burn somebody in a newspaper stand they rape women they like they rob and they kill innocent people and they are not their protagonists so they're the people we're following and they have qualities of human character because they're not one-dimensional but the overall message is this lifestyle is dangerous and it is yeah. something to not be applauded because you will end up miserable max or noodles they both end up miserable we can get to that maybe later yeah yeah i think that's a really good point though because um you know throughout the course of this whole movie whenever they did some sort of um bad action like murder burning someone at a newspaper stand r raping too many women honestly like yeah. well, you shouldn't rape anybody but like no, yeah. it was like the scenes were so long and like super uncomfortable which obviously is the point but like jesus um you never see those actions and think to yourself, at least for me, and think to myself, like, yes, they did it. You know, yeah. like you think about like a, a heist movie, like like a heist comedy or like, yeah. you know, more like lighthearted and you're like, you're pumped that they pulled it off like Fast and Furious whenever they actually like do a heist of sorts. Yeah. You're pumped that they did it. Like the whole team like just got together and did it. And this one, literally anything that they did, uh, you kind of feel like, well, I want to see where this goes, but fuck that was bad this is i completely agree if anything watching this movie made me feel like it was ahead of its time because this is a conversation that's much more prevalent in films i like nowadays where these characters are not one-dimensional so they have blurry gray lines and they have irredeemable actions that make you want to re them realize you you're hoping that they'll realize that what they're doing is wrong but this wasn't something i think very common in movies earlier some movies yes but well think no because like they you know like the sopranos is always like the sh the show that spearheaded the idea of the anti-hero exactly and that but even the sopranos to me and i love the sopranos now you know this yep. still glamorizes tony and the figures in yeah. a way that this movie doesn't this movie shows these guys for who they really are and right even if I'm rooting for them to do the right decision, I'm never hoping to be them. And that's a different emotion. It reminds me a lot of, I had two movies in my head now that it reminded me of. Um, Hell or High Water, if you ever saw that movie. Uh, parts of it. Yeah, the, if you watch that movie, it does a great job of showing the, the, the criminals and why they're doing what they're doing, but still not redeeming their qualities mm -hmm. because you're also following the police officers, chasing them and seeing that the heartache and the, the trauma that they're going through right. by by chasing them so like they're not they're not saying this is what you should strive to be they're just showing both sides as blurry mm -hmm. another great example and i know we love this movie was three billboards uh, oh yeah sam rockwell's character mm -hmm. it, it's so well done to like show that he needs to change his ways and he starts out as a racist bad cop and like tries to be better and tries to redeem himself these i think are way ahead of its time themes that i see in this movie that other like you know i think honestly other mafia movies just don't do or at least at the time didn't do not even goodfellas does it like to be honest with you yeah no because it it certainly it that gives you like the glitz and the glamour of like the high life the success you don't you don't really get that you get um you get their popularity when it shows their speakeasy and like that final party of like the end of prohibition and whatnot mm -hmm. like a little bit but you know that everyone there who's involved in the whole scheme is dying inside because that's the end of their business. Mm -hmm. um, so no one's having a good time and you're not having a good time either besides just being entertained by the movie in front of you. But another thing though, I just kind of thought about this, you know, you're talking about Sopranos, um, <clears throat> Goodfellas, 
uh, the Godfather sort of glamorizing these. And you're right. I think you're right for the most part. But I also wonder if it just happens to be that these were like super popular and like Once Upon a Time in America, although revered, isn't in the same light as those Possible. three. And like, you know, you mentioned The Sopranos, almost everyone in the room is going to know. You mentioned The Godfather, same everyone's thing. Everyone's going to know. Good and everyone's going to know. They're also the type of characters, um, like our main characters, like Tony, uh, Vito, um, even Michael, have some sort of like, not, not not like meme, like a joke, but like reference in pop culture nowadays, like, you know, like Complex Magazine, for example. They always post pop culture related things. They'll be like, Friday mood and it's Tony eating like prosciutto with a cigar in his mouth. You know what I mean? So like, I don't want Tony to be my Friday mood, <laughs> but at the same time, like he became like an icon in a way. And of like, course. and all these characters in this movie didn't get that sort of limelight. So it's kind of more, I'm going to say it's a little more the fact that these movies became such like pop culture, like phenomenons that their vision got skewed. Like their purpose got skewed into more um maybe like a like not representing what it actually stood for maybe but uh, i'll give you a few examples on why i agree and why i think that it's still not fully that i agree that there are still qualities in both the godfather and definitely sopranos sopranos is the closest to this that i would argue so it's a hard mm -hmm. one to argue against because it is a very real look at what that life is like yeah tony has to do things that are not forgivable but right. it's still in the light of a gangster. So mm -hmm. we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, and Goodfellas. Like Goodfellas also shows like the way that the cocaine addiction and the way that, um, oh man, Ray Liotta's name, I forget it now, but um, yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a little too long, guys. I'm sorry. But uh, the way he treats his wife, those are not redeemable things. No. I agree. But they show the glitz and the glamour right. a little too much that, and they, they don't do anything evil enough that I think the majority of people would look at and be like, that's evil. So it's an interesting conversation. There are rape scenes in this movie and they're really heavy. And I remember you watched it before me and said that and like in the modern day, anything with rape scenes in it, it's a, it's a touchy, touchy subject because why, why is that even necessary to write into things nowadays? Every, for so long. Yeah. And I think, I think it depends on the media that they're using it for. We watched a movie a, like a zombie movie about uh, the Nazis. Uh, Overlord. That had, yeah, that had a rape scene in it. And it's just so out of place and just uncomfortable. And I not, honestly think I blacked that yeah, scene it's out just because so like when bad. we brought it up, I didn't even, I bar hardly remembered. It's, I knew it happened. It's so, like. it's so bad. And it's just, you know, I'm sure that happened in World War II, but to do that in a movie that's a fantasy about World War II is kind of weird. Yeah. But I do think that the scenes are quite necessary in this movie because that is... The epitome of evil that is just the difference between good and bad people right and because our our quote unquote i will call them protagonists i won't call them heroes mm -mm. do that you know that they're bad people and you can yeah. make an argument you can always make an argument that like maybe some outlier of an audience member thinks about that and says like well that's not bad i still glamorize the life just like you can make an argument that showing Sam Rockwell as a racist cop might have some sympathies on the side. But the general population knows that these are things to be condemned and not commended, right? right? For sure. And you don't have that in Godfather. You don't have that in Sopranos. You don't have that in Goodfellas. You don't have that, that big enough thing that makes it so that these guys are truly, truly evil. In fact, in Sopranos, you have the reverse. You have that the... Um, the therapist gets raped yep. and then Tony finds the rapist and does something good. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that these guys aren't capable of doing good things either, but I think it's important to show just how evil these guys are right. you know, rather than putting them in a light of saying, well, they're good guys. They just murder because they're murdering bad people, yeah. right? These guys are not doing that. Like there's no, these guys end up in a place that's just so awful based off what they do. That, like, yeah, they, they wanted this. They, yeah. And at the end of their both Noodle's life and Max's life, they want to die. Yeah. They want to die because of the life that they lived. But they're both incapable of ending it for each other. Exactly. And maybe and that's them being selfish. Maybe that's them having a general change of heart. But, you know. It's remorse is what yeah. it is. I mean, we can get into the ending a little bit now story-wise. But... Well, before we do that, I do have... 
I think a stronger comparison to what you were saying about like, and it, it's a totally different um, life that it sort of um, is showing. But I would say in the sake of not having any redeemable or characters that you root for, um, but it's still being a good program and being, um, you know, compelling and you being invested in these characters, the show Succession. Everyone that I know watches it. And if you haven't watched it, it's fantastic. Every character is a piece of shit. No one has any good qualities. They have some human moments every now and then, but nothing about their super excess rich life um, and their general personalities. I don't feel like people watch it and they, they, everyone doesn't like any character. Like they might get entertained by them. Like that's what it is. It's kind of like watching the way that show is made. It's kind of like watching a reality show that's just twisted. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, everyone's a scumbag. No one's really redeemable. You don't root for anyone. You root for who's ever getting screwed the most to get screwed the least, but only because you want to see everyone else get screwed over because you don't like them. But and you're still infatuated by them and their character. And that's how I felt watching this movie. They all are terrible people. And I didn't sympathize with them or empathize with their situation because like they wanted this mm -hmm. in succession. They all want the money. They want the power. They want everyone else to like suffer. Yeah. Same sort of thing. Um, but it's still a great show as this is a great movie mm -hmm. and you're invested in these characters and their arc. Well, I think that it's trying to teach something or like yeah. just show you the life. Like exactly. Another thing that makes this movie different to me is that it's an autobiography. I don't know if you did the read yep. up on it, but the guy who wrote this book used the pseudonym and he's actually the like really noodles. Mm -hmm. Like he wrote this as an autobiography and he wrote it while he was in jail, I think in Sing Sing. And part of what I think his writing was about very different than again, the, the fiction of Godfather, which is showing that lifestyle. And I can get into kind of the talks we used to have in this film school about Godfather, which I really enjoyed. This movie, I think, was almost a teaching moment of this man sitting in reflection of the life he chose while sitting in, uh, while being in prison and reflecting on the evils he had done and how he wished he chose a different lifestyle. And that that voice comes through in this film as yeah, well. Absolutely. It, it shows that this is not something you want. No. And that, to me, takes the cake as far as like gangster movies go. Because the truth is, unless you're making a facetious, fun film like a heist movie like Ocean's Eleven where you want to root for the guys or a John Wick where he's killing a bunch of people and you're rooting for that. If, if you're trying to make a serious look at a subject, then this is a great example of doing it in a way that's engaging, but also not uh, plotting the lifestyle, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Godfather does something that's really interesting that we talked about in my genre class, which was that it... it kind of allowed gangsters in like Sopranos. It allowed Sopranos to come forth as a, as a series because what The Godfather did was give some, some of these like mafioso guys in the 90s a glamorized look of what it used to be. And the question then becomes, was it ever really true? Or is it like a false memory that was invoked by the film itself? This glamorization of that life allows for the realities to take, take place 40 years later in the 90s with Sopranos. Like, no, this is the reality. Like, but it's not like the good old days, like sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. This movie wouldn't give you that. You no. don't have a good old days look when you watch this movie. This is like Jesus. Like, yeah, this no. was a terrible, terrible life. At the end guys. of the day, Tony doesn't sit down in his desk or against the bed with his guma no. and think to himself, I'm noodles. No, exactly. If he did... He would be in a lot more therapy sessions. He'd be he'd be miserable. There's actually a really good scene also in this that we talked about in film school. We had to watch it in script writing class, um, and I think it's a perfect example of Leone. And I'd love to talk about it really quick um, as far as like storytelling goes from this guy's perspective. Mm. There's a scene where Patsy, I think it's Patsy, buys a cupcake in yep. order to go. Patsy. Uh huh. Yeah, it's Patsy. It's Patsy. He buys a cupcake in order to go have sex with, um, I forget the lady's name now. You might remember. Uh, I think it's Peg. Peg. Yeah, Peggy. Because she says, you can do whatever you want to me if you get a cupcake. <laughs> and he gets to her house and he knocks on the door. He's got the cupcake. And then waiting in anticipation for sex, you know, as a young adolescent boy. He Literally eats, like a 12-year-old yeah, boy. <laughs> he eats the cupcake. And 
it sh like when we learned about that in school, what was so amazing about that scene was these kids were trying to grow up too soon was kind of the message there. Like mm -hmm. he was so allured by this idea of sex because that's what happens when you're an adult and that's what you crave and strive for. And these boys want to be gangsters and hoodlums and they want to rise up and take control of the neighborhood, but they're just kids. They're yeah. just kids. And you see that so well in that scene where his child adult, like his childlike nature takes control of him and mm -hmm. he can't resist but eat the cupcake at the expense of having sex. The cupcake is too alluring. And that's just such a genius scene. Yeah, it really is. Unbelievable. Like barely any words needed to show you that these guys are kids. Yep. They're just too young for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh man, I could talk about this movie all day long. It's so amazing. We're not trying to run the same have the same runtime. <laughs> no, 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 no. Definitely not. We're not trying to challenge the movie. Yeah, but I do um not necessarily the plot but one thing and we briefly touched on it uh that i just i gotta highlight is just talk about james woods oh, batman man. so my only exposure to james woods really was as probably most people like my age is the character he plays himself in the family guy and also voicing hades and hercules and then he also was in the movie john q but that didn't captivate me good movie though um, so for the most part, I only know James Woods is kind of like a witty, fast talking, um, funny man, like in family guy, he's funny. And obviously as Hades, he's funny. He's got that rage in him, obviously. And, uh, so this was my first exposure really to him as just a general, like dramatic character with like so much depth to him. And it was just captivating, like, you know. I see De Niro in a mafia movie. I'm like, okay, I know what to expect. I know it's going to be good. I know he's going to play the part well. So I wasn't, I wasn't not looking forward to his performance, but I already, I kind of already knew what was going to happen with yeah. that. So James Woods, I've never seen him in this life before. And he just stole the show from me. I think he's the best character. He's the best amazing. performance. Uh, he just shows you that, that same sort of thing that he's, that I know him for. Um, smooth talking, funny personable um but at the same time like you can tell behind the eyes that there is a psycho there yeah who's ready to snap at any Absolutely. moment and just get his way which is also kind of funny because he technically plays that character of himself in family guy as they go on he becomes a tormentor of the griffins and everybody gets away with it because everybody else loves him because he's james woods and he's the, he's like fucking their life over um <laughs> So he technically does play a version of Max as playing a version of himself at some points in Family Guy. That's so funny. I don't actually know James Woods from anything else besides this now. Like I might know him from a few things, like seeing him in a Family Guy episode, or I remember Hercules as a kid, mm -hmm. but phenomenal. He's just so, so unbelievably great in this movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's really, Noodles' character to me feels a little passive sometimes. And James Wood's really electrifying, like really running the gang. Yeah. And I, I like that a lot. I, I think that, ah, man, yeah, the combination of the two was just unbelievable. And I'm not a huge De Niro fan. Like, I like De Niro. Um, I've seen his classics, but this to me was like, this was, wow. good. This was really probably my favorite De Niro's mafia movie I've ever seen. I think I think I'd agree. I will say, even the the kid who played young Max had the same energy as James Woods. Like, yeah. that was great casting. I, I'm curious. It's also a oh, side note on that. Very smart that they had um, that same kid play James Woods' yep. son. Because that's the immediate, again, showing, not telling. Yep. You see the face, and it instinctively makes you think of Max yeah. somehow. I was literally, I just went like, holy shit. It's Max's <laughs> it's kid. Max. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like, oh my God, it's Max's son. It's like, I knew him immediately. But I was going to ask this, and this is maybe going to the, how unsuccessful this movie was. How it's become very popular, and especially the European cut is considered to be one of the greatest movies ever made. But... That's the version we watched. This is the version we watched. Yeah, don't watch the American cut. It, it Don't puts let it, that shorter runtime tempt you. No, seriously, it, it changes the order of scenes and everything. It's really oh, it's literally chronological, right? Yeah, it's chronological. It's very strange. It's almost like uh, it's two separate movies. I read somewhere is very funny that one critic put the American cut on the worst movie of 1984 and then put the European <laughs> cut when he saw it later, the best movie of 1984, because they're two separate movies. <laughs> um, 
But I think what maybe also made this film not as successful was it feels really out of place in time. Not necessarily that the the movie takes place in a different time. It's a period piece. But, but when it was released. But yeah, Leone's style doesn't really lend itself well to a post-blockbuster world. Mm -hmm. You know, this was the age of Star Wars, of uh, Jaws, um, Ar uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark had already come yeah. out. Hell, but, The Godfather. The Godfather. Like, And I think that we got much more interested in big explosions, fast-paced content, a lot of action scenes. So when I watched this movie, it actually reminded me a lot of 60s movies. It felt older than 1984. Uh, it definitely did. It did, right? Yeah. So and I feel like maybe that had also kind of influenced hmm. why this movie didn't do so well. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's, that's probably a good point. I'd also say, I just wonder if the success of godfather one and two um kind of muddied the waters for any mafia movie trying to come out around the same time you know like either people being done with it or being like i feel well, but we godfather had already come out like godfather was 73 and 76 so this was already like almost 10 years later that's a good point i was thinking i don't know why i was thinking like 78 and 82 but i also didn't look this up beforehand no, but, yeah, no, the Godfather uh, the came out time, before though. Jaws. Yeah, oh, shit, yeah. But still, you know, it's it's still kind of one of those things where it's like, um, well, I mean, you can even say like right now, um, there's a Lord of the Rings series coming out. Are people tired of getting more Lord of the Rings renditions after Probably. those yeah, that's first three movies and not being that invested in The Hobbit, mm -hmm. comparatively speaking? It could just be the same thing, like, these two movies were done so so well and were so like successful and appreciated did people want to steer away and go to another de niro mafia movie that is not the same and it's not Possible. portrayed the it's, same yeah, way i understand I, yeah maybe it, it's hard for people to wrap their brains around another story with a central character similar to the godfather at the time um, i just wonder if it came off especially in america yeah uh, with this bad cut if it came off as like a cheap knockoff in a way yeah it's possible that's actually really possible it's probably definitely that the cut was also bad at some point in our lives i'd be very interested to see if we can find it because it's an hour and a half of our time and just see yeah. how bad it would be but <laughs> that's crazy that, that is that crazy they made it that short. the original cut is six hours the original cut that he made is six hours and there's a scene in the film that i had to google afterwards because i didn't understand it but it's an original from it's a scene left in from the original cut James Woods and Robert De Niro, Noodles and Max, leave the hospital after the union guy is shot up. Mm -hmm. And you see Joe Pesci, Frankie, walk into the elevator whistling. Yep. And they zoom in on him. And they never go back to that. They never explain yeah. again why he's there, what he's doing, blah, blah, blah. So I actually thought that Cockeye and Patsy had died. I had this idea in my head that he was going up there to take revenge on them for killing Joe and all the diamond people. And hmm. they never really went back to it. You see uh, Patsy and Cockeye later, so they definitely didn't die. But it seems like that was a relic of the six-hour cut that just never made it to the uh, to any theatrical yeah, That's weird because like even the even the union guys survived. He did, right? Yeah, yeah. and, and I you see think, him in the thirty year later parts. Yeah, on and, TV. Yeah, and I also think that the Frankie had nothing to do with the union. There was not the same like two stories, right? Frankie was the, or maybe I don't know that. To be honest with you, something I've also noticed with a movie like this is it's a lot of self-contained stories about one man's life, not just one overarching plot, which means mm -hmm. the plots can sometimes get a little hard to, to figure out what's what, and it's really just the more or less the theme of the characters. So the thugs in the beginning hunting down noodles, I don't really know who they are or like who hired them to hunt down noodles, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really matter because it's a catalyst for him to get out of town and lose all his money. And well, no, we, uh, we see, we see them with Joe Pesci. We do. Yeah. When they first get introduced to Joe Pesci, those guys are there or at least one of them. Oh, the guy who plays, there. um, What's his name? I can't remember. Paulie and Rocky. 
<clears throat> oh yeah okay he's yeah, one yeah, of the yeah, guys yeah, in the right. beginning and he's also I, like yeah right with joe pesci i googled it afterwards just to check to see if i missed something and i guess pesci is kind of in control of a mafia gang called the syndicate and i mm-hmm. think that james yep. woods makes a deal with the syndicate to get out and kill them and take the money from them except james woods that's why james right woods, that's why he survived that's why he survived <clears throat> yeah which because I think they were controlling the cops or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. It was a big operation under James Wood's mastery plan of escaping. Mm-hmm. Which, before we move on to maybe more of the technical stuff we love about the filmmaking, I think we we could talk about the ending a little bit and why it's just so amazing. And I think, for me at least, it's great because I get James Woods's point. Like, you got to kill me. This investigation is going to, like, unveil everything. My life will be ruined. But I just don't buy that as an, as an actual reason. Like, personally, I like to think that James Woods couldn't live with the guilt of putting Noodles in this situation. Like, my interpretation was that Noodles had a hard, horrible life because he lost everything and had to leave town. And James Woods got everything he wanted in life, but at the expense of his best friend. And because of that, they both live awful lives. Yeah. And this lifestyle they chose led them to a place where they're both unhappy but not able to take their own lives. They have to like reconcile with each other and they also just can't take each other's lives. That's why it's so damning, like mm-hmm. the lifestyle. But that's well, that's what I love about just the end of that scene where Noodles says, um, uh, I, I'm going to paraphrase it, but um, Max died you know, like many years ago. Like, have a good night, um, Mr. Mr. Bailey. Secretary, Mr. Bailey. Bailey. Secretary Bailey. And he leaves. Like, that's just the... That's just great writing, but also just like a great line that kind of going into showing, not telling, where like he doesn't turn to him and say like, well, I thought you died for all these years and now I'm not going to kill you. Just that that one quick line is enough to tell you everything you need to know about how he's feeling and why he won't do it. I'd almost want to, we can't get the rights and we don't have time to do it on the podcast, but I would almost rewatch that scene with you for all the just dialogue gems in there, like is this your way of getting revenge? Uh, Max asks, and he's like, no, it's just how I see things. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just such a good line. Like, he sees it as his friend Max died that night. Regardless if this is Max in front of him, Max died that night. Mm -hmm. And, like, the lines at the end before he leaves are just saying, you know, it didn't end well for both of us. I've done things I regret. I can't remember everything he says, but thinking about it gives me chills. It just really gives me chills to see these characters end up in such a horrible place and just with with guilt and grief and they're just both unhappy no matter how it worked out for either of them that it seems like the only two that actually got away safely from this life was cockeye and patsy for literally dying Mm -hmm. yeah oh man the ending is just so amazing yeah it was i was tense the whole time just waiting to see what was going to happen yeah but so what do you think what do you think happened when he saw Max go by like the, it's not like a wood chipper, but like the garbage truck with the, with the grinder. Do you Honestly, think he hopped in? I don't know. I don't know. I've read now that apparently it's not really supposed to be known. So either opinions, but I'd like to think he didn't because. I, mean, I feel like you would have saw like blood. <laughs> no, but I think Leone wanted to keep it really ambiguous. Right. Like, and didn't want anyone yeah, to know. Absolutely. I think the reason I think that he didn't was because to me it would ruin the narrative that he needed noodles to kill him because if he was able to take his own life the whole time for his guilt then why didn't he there's an argument to be made that he gave the option to noodles and the fact that noodles doesn't want to do it now he want he actually wants him to watch him die yeah yeah or he's like like noodles bested me in a way like at the end like he's a better man than i am type of thing or like i gave him the opportunity now i'm ready to die possible i like to think probably not I think that like a worse punishment for Woods is to not die. Right. That's what it is. The worst punishment is that he can't die. He has to live with his guilt. The same way that Noodles will have to go on living with the reality that he lost his love for his actions. He lost his friends. He's, he was living in Buffalo and he's an old man who can't see too well anymore and just alone. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. What do you think about the end? There's a theory that it's a dream. That he, when you see him in the opioid house and he's just no. smiling, and then no, the dream, the dream ending is too much of a dog shit move for Sergio Leone, Sergio Leone, to do that. I agree. 
I uh, all I all I would say is that it's just the power of going back, and maybe if anything, um, after encountering Max that night at his house and at his party, that we're m- meant to think that Noodles is feeling the same way he did the night that he thought he ratted Max out and got him killed. Say that one more time. Like going back to him at the opioid house Mm -hmm. is just reflecting on um, he's feeling the same exact way. Guilty about um, about his actions and about like after seeing seeing Max and knowing that he's still that he was still alive all this time. um, You know, just bringing you back to that moment. One, because it's in the beginning and just bringing you back to it. Um, and revisiting it but also I feel like making like showing you that he's kind of in the same position or feeling the same way that he felt that night at the opioid house it's a good point yeah I find that maybe Leone just liked the idea of ending where you started sort of Mm -hmm. sort of thing but it's also just shows you the genius of his filmmaking because of all the talking that happens about that scene so -hmm. maybe he intended nothing except to end where you started but everyone, wants a lot. To, but everyone wants to talk about it. Yeah. I like, personally, I like the interpretation that it's either a sign of like release, like he's free, or that he could see the genius of Max's plan. Not that, I don't think that it's a dream, but I also it think it can't be, be. I think it, no, it can't be. But I think that it's really interesting to maybe assume that Noodles knew Max didn't die that night and he just smiles because he could see that that mm. wasn't Max's body and that like Max, Max got away, Max got out. He, he tricked Noodles into helping him escape the lifestyle. Like, and he smiles because he, he, he sees the genius of the plan. Oh, uh, that's a good point. That might be kind that, of a cool interpretation. Not, but I, yeah. I like that it's open to interpretation. It's such a... I really could, either, I think either of our interpretations is pretty plausible. Absolutely. I kind of didn't think about the smiling part. But. Well, because the whole scene is kind of weird. Like you see the the truck go away, and then like the cars from the '30s come out. It's a little weird sequence, but I love that type of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Like, give us a bunch of fuel to stoke our intellectual fire, and then like people will just talk about it. What does this all mean? I don't think the director actually needs it to mean anything. He just knows it's going to make you talk. You that look cool, <laughs> and it looks cool. So, what about the filmmaking strategy of Leone? We talked a little bit about this in the beginning you know about how he makes you sit in the scenes but is there like particular things you noticed about his style that you really were like wow that's amazing um or maybe things you were like ah he could, maybe he's overrated in that <laughs> well where to begin with that no um i think this is a movie i mean it, it's a combo of like the editing of going back and forth between all the time hops is well done and it's captivating it keeps it going nothing feels long-winded these flashbacks these flash forwards whatever um, but I have to say the cinematography is what is what makes this movie for me. Yeah. Um, just every scene is dynamic, even if it's, you know, for the whole, like, the, there's like the first five minutes of the movie, all you hear is a telephone ring on top of all the other actions. I honestly thought my, my streamer was broken. <laughs> I thought that my phone was right in the house. I had to look at the subtitles to make sure it wasn't the phone. So, the well, I'm, so, yeah. I'm, so I'm watching it at like late at night. And, and Catherine was asleep and like where I'm watching it is, is close to like um, our bedroom. And I was like, I know, like, we don't have a phone that sounds like this. But at the same time, is she going to wake and be like, why is a phone ringing? <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, hurry up, guys. Hurry up. Let's get to the next part so we can get this phone ring. He answers, it's a long he phone answers ring. the phone and it's like the not the right phone that's ringing because he's dialing and calling somebody else. And I was like stressing. I was like stop <laughs> answer the phone <laughs> but that aside um again though it's the cinematography and like everything is dynamic that whole thing of the repeating phone ringing there's so much happening upon like the thing that's sitting in your head like this phone's ringing who the fuck's gonna pick it up but seeing everything happening any long scene in like one location um like the one at the end when max and noodles reunite that is a long scene and it's all in the one room but like the power of the moving cameras and obviously the cuts Mm -hmm. back and forth and whatnot um it's captivating it makes it 
it makes a long scene kind of fly by. Like you, you get invested and you Absolutely. feel like you're part of it. It's very, very dynamic filmmaking, which I think is what what is the forgivable quality to it being so long winded. Yeah. That the the shots are. I was trying to like pay a lot of attention, and I wish I got some in my head that were a bit stronger than this one, but there's a shot of like them tracking James Woods, like from inside the, like, I think it's at the end. I can't even remember the scene anymore, but it starts at a table, turns to him, pans over to when he goes to get something, comes back and never cuts. And it's just, that to me is so, especially at the time, so dynamic. I mean, you can do that nowadays, right? Yep. But it's a lot easier to do it nowadays, to take the time to track shots like that back then. There's the scene where, Noodles comes out of the opioid house and he goes to Moe's and then he goes around the alleyway to go check about the, check their speakeasy just in the beginning. And it starts from a wide shot on the other side of the street with wagons going across, pans down, comes into the alleyway with them. There's no drones. Like how, like there's yeah. cranes. These are all crane shots they're doing the whole time. Yeah. And it's, it's so, it's so beautiful. Every shot looks like almost like a set and painting build. That, that shot of them walking into the frame of the bridge, like, oh my God, like it's the cinematography is just unbelievable in yeah, this movie. Totally agree. The sound design, the sound design is just fantastic, minimal, but perfect. Yep. Just a clock or, a, or turning the coffee. Um, and I, again, the editing, it makes you sit. I love that. Like how many, how many setups per scene, man? If they have like a, right like think about it you know we would do what we're doing right now is two cameras and like a wide shot and don't tell them no well i mean come on <laughs> it's two cameras and a wide shot we have a but, dp with uh on a gimbal going back and forth <laughs> but it's it's insane like it's so many different angles they have to do i wonder how long it takes to film something like that no, i mean if they had a six hour cut you gotta like I don't even know how many times you get to times that for like the nut, like the hours of footage they actually on had. film too, right? Like on back film on, too. On, my god, if someone told me to edit this, I'd tell them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> this is like Apocalypse Now type editing. You yeah. should read that that book I gave you, A Blink of an Eye. They talk about editing the Apocalypse Now. It's uh, unbelievable. It's a good book, really good book. If you guys are interested in editing, um, or reading, or reading, it's very short. I think it's like 110 pages, but. Um, yeah, no, you're right. It's the cinematography, the storytelling. It's, I, it doesn't get enough views or enough credit. I think, I agree. honestly. So where would you put it as far as, um, out of the movies we've seen on this podcast? You know, all the different ones we've seen. What are we thinking as far as like how good was this one? How happy are you that you watched it? Just below Dilettantes, because Dilettantes number one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hmm, that's a good question. I'm tempted to say it's the top. Um, if I had to say in terms of the long ass movies we watch, it's easily the top. Um, because like those antiquity epics that we watched, they're very long, but they're not as dynamic. Like it, they're, they're older. Like, they're older. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, you know still using semi-similar technology still did it on film and all that stuff yeah. um but i just think they're they're less dynamic those are just generally like good like folklore folklore stories and and also the the, the, the sets and stuff is the the impressive part is like how massive scale they were to make yeah right? yeah but exactly. i agree with you but anyway like this in terms of that it was the best long-winded movie we've seen because it's not doesn't feel long-winded it's like the fastest three hours and 50 minutes of my life i uh, kind i really have to agree looking back on it i can't really think of another movie towards the end we started like watching more um you know like john hughes things or or you know we we had a weird mixture of like pop culture -y stuff that we wanted to watch like a john hughes month and then we also had a month on my dinner with andre and the limits of control so very artsy so i might want to answer it on the next podcast to see like if there's any ones that i'm missing particularly i remember thoroughly enjoying our kung fu classics month like before we even started recording a podcast those movies were fantastic uh, but i wasn't going to consider them because no but i mean part of the, the iron, canon. iron monkey i mean yeah it's just so good and then what else we watch crouching tiger crouching tiger um hero oh hero. hero is just 
Yeah, that's both, just a beautiful movie. That's just beautiful. Brian and I really, really love uh, kung fu movies. We never did the Thirteen Chambers of Shaolin, did we? Is it thirty-six? Oh, thirty. It's thirty-six. I for, I can't remember the number. Yeah, well, because I only know it from the Wu Tang album. Is it thirty-six? It might be thirty-six. That's Enter the Thirty-six Chambers. Oh, the it's like the Wu Tang yeah. album. Did you ever watch that movie? No, I haven't. You should. It's really great. Um, then I will. But, but yeah, as far as podcast movies go that we've seen, like I'm tempted, I'm tempted to put it up there. Um, it's at least top three. I'll say that it's at least top three. Is it better than the month we did? Fell through the cracks. There were some pretty good ones that month. It's, uh, I think it's still better. Yeah, because uh, really, I don't even remember which ones I watched of that list, but I didn't like Inherent Vice. Yeah. No. Um, I did really like Call Me By Your Name, but I don't think it's a favorite movie of mine, although I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And yes. then what was the other one? Um, I watched another one. Dr. Sleep was in there. Dr. Sleep. I did really like that, but again, it's not just, one I would yeah. put in a favorite movie of mine. No, as far like, as, I mean, this is truly, when when critics call this one of the greatest movies ever made, it it really does kind of hold its title well. None of the movies I think we've watched have gotten remotely close to being one of the greatest ever made. Enjoyable yeah, that doesn't level. That doesn't stop me from putting something... Like American Psycho is one of my all-time favorite movies. Great and that's movie. never going to be in that conversation. It's it's really up there for cult classics, I think. For cult classics, yeah, but not... Not like, best ever made. Right. So and usually, that's also a bloated list. Like, look, I've seen Citizen Kane. I get why at the time it's considered one of the greatest movies ever made, but it's also not really a movie I enjoy right. too too much. You know, well, that's usually that's usually how I am. Where it's like um, movies that are super revered and like, oh, it's one of the best movies of all time, cinematic masterpiece. And I'm like, sure, I can't argue with you, but it's not like a favorite of mine. No. This is one of those rare movies. Honestly, that. And like Twelve Angry Men are like two, so two movies where like never seen that. they're super you know super like um, respected and like mm -hmm. always in like those top lists and they're like the, the two of the few where like I was like oh okay I'm sure and then I watch them like fucking hell yeah yeah they are yeah it's like top movies right there that's like, that is literally every Leone movie I've ever seen has done that for me like because I remember watching Good the Bad and the Ugly thinking this is a movie everyone should watch and what I remember about that movie was for the majority of it, I didn't like it for like the longest amount of time because it's so long and so slow and you got to get used to the style. But maybe you can, maybe you can tell me if you felt this with this movie or if you just enjoyed it all the way through. It's Leone's endings that can really pay off the entire movie, you know? I mean, that's the last hour is my favorite part. Exactly. Like, especially in this one for me, like where they end up makes the whole thing so worth it because it wouldn't be as impactful if it was shorter. If we got less time of these characters' lives, we wouldn't understand why this is so and meaningful when they meet up again. And yeah. it's the same thing. And it's the same thing in Good, Bad, the Ugly is the payoff at the end. Like the ending only works because you spend so much time invested in the characters. And conversely, The Irishman does not do that for me. No. I think the last hour of The Irishman is excellent. The first two hours were kind of a waste of my time. Exactly. The Irishman does a really good job in giving you that feeling at the end of like, this is not a life to be glamorized. But it doesn't give you, I think, enough time with the character or slow burn feeling in order to really appreciate that last hour. It's like almost like a three-hour movie posing as a action film but that just gets a little boring there's a lot of scenes in there with a lot of action and for three hours that's just too much yep. this is different this is like seeing a character from his entire life really understanding like the the dynamics between him and him and his friends the evils that they they do you know seeing them as people a movie that does do that for me and i know i bring him up every podcast is quinn tarantino hateful eight. Oh yeah hateful eight slow it's interesting it's dialogue heavy unlike leone but it does the exact same thing. Yep. It gives you enough time with these characters to understand who they are and really invest in who they are. And then at the end of the movie, when the racist and the black man team up to kill the villain, it feels like you're so worth it. Like you saw something really meaningful and you saw, I don't know, an instance of humanity that, that meant a lot, you know, to these two characters, but only because we were with them for so long. Yeah, totally you know? agree. Yeah. Great movie. Uh, top three, definitely. 
maybe number one of the best we've ever seen on the podcast. Yeah. Do some debriefing before I can make that claim. I don't want to just be like off the hype of it and be like, yeah, number one movie for me. But no, me neither. Me neither. That could change in the next episode. Who the hell knows? But, but I, I do think, think that's, that's why the, the, the length of it, the slow burn, it's important. You need to get a sense of who these characters are and it should be boring. You should kind of tune in and out a little bit, you know, yeah, and then agreed. like you almost get to know them like a TV show and maybe doing it in one shot is better than I read up also that like the Godfather kind of molds all together as one thing. And then this is just one movie. Mm. I'm in, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what people's thoughts are on that. Like actually having it as one long movie versus like three installments. Well, kind of the same thing as the people who would rather watch four one hour episodes in one sitting of a show than watch one four hour movie. Exactly. The idea of whether it's the break or the, the kind of the impulsive need to add a suspending twist or like, um, wow, well, total blank. Um, cliffhanger? Cliffhanger. cliffhanger. Um, that's four cliffhangers mm -hmm. as opposed to zero cliffhangers. Yeah. Just general like flatline tension and like seeing where it's going. Yeah. Waiting for the spikes to happen. Absolutely. I don't I think, think there's any true. directors that I prefer doing that than Tarantino or Leone. I can like put up with their long winded storytelling in order to yeah. in order to enjoy that payoff. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is another example. I enjoy the payoff so much. Yeah, that's just a fun movie. It is. This is a great movie, guys. This is fantastic. Please watch. Watch. <laughs>